Would you please welcome the very brave Jeff Duff and MacArthur Park. Spring was never waiting for his girl It ran one step ahead as we followed in a dance Like a striping pair of pants MacArthur's park is melting In the dark All the sweet green icing Flowing down Someone left the cake out In the rain And I don't think that I can take it Cause it took so long to make it And I'll never have that recipe again Ladies and gentlemen, today's guest in the voodoo room is the iconic Jeff Duff Now look at my hair, I came my hair and it looks just, it just looks too neat <laughs> oh, it's all right. It goes with your sweater, mate Oh, I've been out there. Yeah, I mean, have you been having I just a ball? A walk there because it's beautiful and sunny here in Sydney. What's the temperature in Sydney? It's 123. <laughs> 123. Six, six, six wickets down for 123. <laughs> you know, Melbourne's had an incredible start to the winter. We haven't had much rain. We've had blue skies and really cold mornings. It's incredible. But you mean colder than normal? Cold, yeah, it has. It's been like getting up down to about five degrees at night and uh, during the day it's blue skies and really pleasant. It's um, no wind. Yeah, we, yeah. because I actually I was just sitting, I, I live right on the harbour. I mean, I, my balcony overlooks the harbour. It's so beautiful here. But I just went down for a walk just before I came in here to do this and um, a woman was sitting alongside. I said, are we socially distanced? She was from New Zealand and she said, <laughs> She said, yeah. She said, this, isn't this incredible weather? She said, I, I've just come back from Melbourne, well, before the travel bans. Yeah. And she said, it was freezing there. And I said, it's the wind in Melbourne, isn't it? She said, exactly, the wind in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, the wind comes from uh, the southern part of Tasmania, you know, Bass Strait. Bass Strait, yeah. Straight off those ice sheets down in uh, the Antarctic. And, uh, man, it, it takes your breath away sometimes, doesn't it? You become acclimatised to the cold, don't you? Well, as I get older, I, uh, get, I'm getting less tolerant with it. I used to put up. Oh, with are it. you? Yeah, I just, I, I, it's no good for your health, Jeff. It, you know, if you've got health issues, you're better off in the northern part of Australia, I think. But do you have any, um, any uh, lung problems? At all? Well, I, I suffered with asthma as a teenager, oh. but uh, I did. Yeah, I think you remember. I yeah. remember you telling me that. Yeah. What about Joe? Same as a family thing? No, no, I was the only one. Joe, Joe right. had nothing. He, he, he escaped. He had no diseases. He's got no respiratory problems. He's got no heart problems. He's, got, he's all good. Yeah, well, I've got the respiratory thing. I, ha I uh, inherited that from my mum who died at 50, can, can you believe, from this. I wrote it down because I went to the doctors the other day because I said people keep asking me what I had as a child to have a, a complete year off from school in hospital when I was about six or seven. And um, it's a really long word. I can't even remember what it was, but it was uh, like it's a, an infection in the lung. But I've beaten it by playing all this sport. And also I think the thing that's helped me get over my respiratory problems is singing every day. It's just really opened my lungs. Mm. I mean, I've been learning all this blood, sweat and tears. Oh, that's the other thing. I'm doing a blood, sweat and tears in Chicago show and learning all those songs again it's such big singing it's fantastic so excited yeah i mean th anyway they're big songs too are we, jeff uh, are we do is this an interview yeah we're started but that's okay oh, have we? Yeah, <laughs> hang on wondering. where's my makeup artist hey <laughs> francois come in here francois <laughs> yes put your pants back on francois <laughs> wanders around here without pants look at the size of that thing <laughs> I mean, the makeup brush. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing um, with your current album? Because you were saying that you're working on a new album. How's that coming along? Oh, man, I'm so excited. I'm more excited about this than, than I have been since I recorded my last three albums in London in the early 80s. Ironically, the producer is the same guy that I had on those three albums in London. 
So we've renewed our friendship and we've written the songs and recorded them all online on this daggy little laptop here. Mm. And, um, you know, he's done all the hard hard grind, though. He's he's the musician. He's laid down all the tracks. He's got these incredible samples from L.A., which are really, really expensive and um, just amazing backtracks. And uh, so we've written the songs together over the last probably four months. I don't even know how. Somebody asked me the other day, Glenn Rhodes, I said, how did you start this thing? And I said, I don't know. It's just evolved from an idea. Uh, one song, two songs, three songs, and all of a sudden ten songs, we've got an album. <clears throat> And, um, yeah, I'm really, really happy with it. So you've been singing straight into the computer, have you? Or No, I've been singing into my, my little, my trusty mobile. Oh, wow. I sing, in, I sing into, into there. Um, and you're going to use then, that? Are you going to use some of those vocals that you've recorded on your phone? Some of them. Some of them are really good because yeah. I have a, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here two, three, four in the morning <laughs> doing it and, um, some of them really have really captured, you know, a particular spirit. I'm sure Joe will tell you about that. Sometimes, you know, the cheapest microphones and the, you know, you might be feeling really like a dog, but but for some reason you capture the spirit of the song and the, mm. and the vocal. Yeah. So there's been a few of those, but no, I think um, Sev, uh, my 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 producer in London, said that uh, a lot of them are very noisy uh, coming through the, mo- the the mobile phone. But it's a great way of doing demos through the mobile. And then I just email my my voice back to uh, him, and he loads it up on the backing track, uh, adds a little bit of verb or whatever is is needed, and then um, it just gives us an idea of a guide mm. track. Then, uh, but um, and is, yeah, it's been it's it, been an educational exercise. And is the music uh, contemporary, or is it sort of in line with what you're doing? You know, like mu- like musically, like is it is it uh, really lush strings and horns and all that sort of stuff, or is it sort of stripped back and just really meat and potatoes, drums and guitars and bass sort of thing? No, there's none of that. It's all huge production. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, I called. Um, I spoke to George Ellis, who's the uh, the conductor arranger for um, Sydney Symphony Orchestra, because he I did Bowie Symphony with him, and I said, "Hey, George, would you be interested in me doing a concert with my?" my new album, which is called The King of Paradise, because um, um, it's really lush, huge. There's a, there's a couple of more simple things, but mostly it's pretty lush. But it's all about the songwriting. I think we've just, I, I forgot what it was like working, working with Sev 40 years ago. Like we, 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 we did three, we recorded three killer albums in the 80s in London. I guess it was uh, after the post-punk thing and the, the power pop thing, you know, around about the time of all those independent records and uh, record companies in London starting like Stiff Records and, you know, where Elvis Costello and Ian Dury and all those people, I started working with Sev then. Sev is the, the producer. And um, it's just like 40, Sev said the other night, he said, can you believe it's 40 years since we did those albums? And I said, yeah, but this is just like start doing the same thing, a continuation. And it is, you know. When you've got somebody that you align with, musically and probably as far as personality too then it's it's easier it just locks yeah. in quickly absolutely there's a bit of um unity with that isn't there when you lock in yeah with- i'm probably not the best singer and songwriter and, and Sev's probably not the best producer and uh, musician but you know whatever whatever it is the formula just seems to work mm. it's just like we write so quickly and then, and then it takes us ages back and forth from London to Sydney, London to Sydney, London. To Sydney, all through the night, we're sending stuff back and forth until we refine it. Mm. And um, the final thing will be, even though I've done some pretty great vocals uh, through my mobile, uh, sending them back, uh, I need a really good studio to keep up with uh, with Sev's samples because yeah. his samples are, you know, world class. Mm. They're amazing. You know, it's a bit like a painting. The more you have the painting on the canvas in front of you and you've got the availability of brushes and paint, the more you're likely to dabble with it and keep changing it. Yeah. And that's what's happening with these songs. We keep, And I, I, I said to Seb the other night, I said, gee, maybe we should just put a stop to it because there's a chance of ruining things by, by continuing on, I think. Yeah, I mean, it can. I did an album with this Scottish musician, probably about nine years ago now, and it took us a year, not every day, but a year of uh, produ- producing, engineering it, 
uh, going to different studios. We actually went to Hamer Hall and recorded the strings, and it was a very lush mm-hmm. album. Big uh, orchestra? Big. Well, it was a small orchestra. It was only a eight piece. Um, right. But we doubled everything up to try and make it fill it out as much as we possibly could, and we also then brought some of those samples that you're talking about, and we uh, expanded on that. Um, but yeah, it was a year of a labour of love and then we got it mastered at Abbey Road and the engineer from the Hollies mastered it and he did a terrific job and the album came out and, it, you know, it was like, where to now? <laughs> it didn't sell us. We didn't sell anything. We It was just so disappointing because we worked so hard and uh, we put so much effort into it. Yeah, it, it's a weird one because then you go, well, wh- what to now? Where do you go from? You know what I mean? It's a weird one. I, I know. know. That's what Sam said as well. He said, now, uh, he said, after all this, after the recording and mixing and mastering, he said, it's entirely up to you what you do then. In London, like I had three pretty successful albums. You know, you wouldn't have heard about it in Australia. Um, um, the strength of my albums was a publicist. I had... Paul McCartney's publicist for one album. Then I had the Rolling Stones publicist for the other two albums. Yeah. So I was in the in the media all the time, regardless of the quality of my music. <laughs> Although you know I love my music, I was using big orchestras in London as well. But um, if you don't have a publicist, you might as well give up, not even start, mm. because uh, the only way your your record is going to get out there to radio, to the public, to to what to whoever, whoever even regarding the social media thing is via, a, you know, a publicist because they have to push hard and you have to pay them a lot of money. Mm. But, you know, really in Australia there aren't any publicists. No. Nothing. I mean, I use a publicist, but they're not they're not in the same class as Tony Brainsby, who actually, he was McCartney's publicist, who died recently from a cocaine abuse. Oh, wow. And I, I think Keith Eltham, who's a Stones uh, publicist, um, he retired. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm sure there are great publicists oh, yeah. in London now, but it's a different game, it you know, is. 40 years on. It is, isn't it? Because uh, back then you actually had an industry, you know, uh, that you could tap into, whereas now we don't. it's not really an industry. It's sort of, I don't know what it is now, especially with covert. I don't know what it is anymore. Well, I think a lot, it's going to change when it all comes back, if it comes back. I mean, I, I'm, actually I'm being booked for this Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago. That's the problem, you know, like, Thankfully, I've got my original life, you know, playing. This is my. This will be my thirtieth original album, I think. This, the King, the King of Paradise thing. In order to survive, you still need to work live, you know. Nobody wants to hear my original song. So, uh, a promoter approached me and he said, "Would you, would you be willing to front a Blood, Sweat and Tears in Chicago band?" Mm. And and I said, "Yeah." And he's already booked us into Perth and Victoria doing shows in November. I think that's probably about the only time it's going to open, isn't it? By by November, maybe. People want to go out and see something live. They don't want to look at a screen, you know, watching the Beatles anymore. We're we're over it. I think. I think the streaming thing is, it's it's novel, but it's just you know, it's not a permanent source of entertainment, is it? No, 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 no. But uh, I've noticed people are musicians are definitely uh, tapping into it. Like they're going over to people's houses and they're filming from their living room, and then you can. Uh, yeah, but I don't. You know, yeah, I, know. You know, I, I don't think. I don't think there's a big <laughs> audience for it. I think there's too much of it. You yeah. know, and any, you know, my mother and father are doing them. You know, my dog's doing <laughs> yeah. one. You know, in the kennel, and all, there's all of that sort of stuff. I'm next week. I'm doing a. a these people have actually built purpose built a streaming studio. Yeah. It's better than any television station. We went there last week, but you know, but I have to do Bowie. I have to do my, my Bowie show. Mm. I was thinking, fuck. Can I come and do my original songs? Well, there would be an audience for my original stuff. So, um, uh, so you know, people are jumping onto the streaming thing, but I don't think it's the answer. You know, I think, uh, and maybe that's going to the, the streaming, th- the, the mass streaming that's happening. It's going to destroy the live thing when it comes. People will be get <laughs> so bored. Yeah, look, I think there are going to be a lot of changes that happen over this period. Uh, you know, in, in, for, for entertainment, it's. Actually, my blood, sweat, and tears thing's been booked to do this club in Perth in uh, November, but they're only allowed seventy people. Mm. I think, well, gee, that's not going to be much of a vibe, you know. Yeah. That's a, that's crazy. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to happen. Venues will open, and um, I don't know if it's the same in Melbourne, fifty or seventy people, and you think, well, you know, that's hardly going to make a, an impression. How are you keeping in the winter months uh, in Sydney uh, while cricket's not on? Because I know you're an avid cricket player. 
Yeah, um, I jog every morning as soon as I wake up and then I jog late at night, you know, in the middle of recording at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, I jog around the block here. Yeah, I'm jogging around the harbour, so it's beautiful. And I still play tennis. Well, I killed my tennis player uh, uh, two days ago. Not killed him, but he... He, uh, he he got this calf injury. They had to carry him off the court. Jesus. So he was my opponent. So now I still play tennis a few times a week. I have to find a new opponent, and I'm looking forward to cricket. But I, the one thing that I'm pleased they've stopped is spitting on the ball. I I really really loathe. It just reminds me of growing up with my brother. He used to spit all the time. Uh, it used to revolt me. I'm. I was a protected species when I was young, mainly because of my respiratory problems. And I think the spitting thing is disgusting because Steve Smith uh, would spit on the ball and then give it to the bowler. And you think, I used to think, fucking hell, man, that's so filthy, you know. And he was proud of the fact. I heard him yesterday saying that, oh, yeah, that's going to kill my game. I can't spit on the ball anymore and shine it up for the bowler. I think, I think well, it's great that they've banned that. But, you know, how are you going to, unless there's a camera on them all the time, uh, you won't know if they're not spitting on the ball. <laughs> what was the reason for doing that? Was that because of the swing of the ball or? Yeah, if you shine one side of the ball, then it swings okay. uh, either left or right. Okay. Um, and late, late in, the, in the game, you know, they get out swing or in swing and the ball does all sorts of things. That's why from continent to continent regarding cricket uh, and the weather, the ball swing differently in every continent, especially uh, in the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, and also in Asia. You know, with the um, Asian cricket continents. But you know, all all the cricketers they know they do their homework. They know what works best. Worse than that, they used to, you know, they chew gum. Sometimes yeah. they put gum in the, in the the seam of the ball yeah, right. to make it go lopsided. You know, <laughs> there's all sorts of tricks. Wow. Most of the Pakistani cricket team were um, were guilty of doing all those dirty tricks. I mean, I suppose they weren't dirty tricks because most most teams knew about it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until Sandpaper Gate with with, yeah. um, with uh, Warner. Oh, that was Steve Smith and yeah, Warner. Uh, Warner, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until that was exposed that people have zoomed in yeah. <laughs> to watch what, what they're doing with, with the ball between overs. Mm. I was a fan of cricket in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and I reckon that was the best period of Australian cricket. Yeah. Personally, I think. Then it's Lily and yeah, I mean, it. it was exciting, wasn't it? I mean, you had yeah. you had the characters, you had the start of the World Series cricket period, um, and that was exciting, wasn't it? When that came on uh, around that, yeah, time. and it seemed to be far more competitive between the nations as well. Yeah. You know, they really out, and there was, I mean, there was a lot of dirty, dirty pool going on too. You know, but I mean, it was uh, it had a, a real spirit. Mm. You know, and. It was dog eat dog. Oh, it's become a bit sanitised, I think. You know, you're not allowed to abuse your opponents anymore. You're not allowed to – there's none of that um, chat on, on the wicket, you know, to, th- to try and throw your opponent off their game. You know, even in my, my grade of cricket, we, we can get thrown off the field for, uh, for abusing or, or for chatting to an uh, to uh, opposition player. So, um, so you can't you can't uh, go. Oh, you know he's nervous. He's nervous. He's going to go out next ball. You can't do all that sort of stuff. You can't do that anymore. No. Well, you know what they do with, because they know I'm a, a bit of a rock star in Sydney. When I go out there, they start singing. Let's dance. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know the you know that film clip where they uh, film Let's Dance. That just got yeah. sold. They sold the pub for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in Karanda. Corinda, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've been doing a concert there every year yeah, you, at Corinda for the last four years. It's called. This is the first year it's, it hasn't been on. Yeah. Gee, 250 grand. You know, there's um, only four, house, four houses there. Yeah, that's why it's 250 grand. Because the guy used to, yeah. the owner was, he came from Godsford, uh, Gosford and he used to drive yeah. and he said it was just getting too much. He had it for four years and he said it just became uh, untenable for him to drive in every day and do all the books and, you know, and with what's going on now, you know. Yeah, the only time they were making money was when we did the Let's Dance Festival there, you know, in, yeah. in, for, for David Bowie uh, weekend. It was a long weekend and we'd, we'd go up on uh, uh, on the Friday Friday morning and, and we'd play concert on Friday, Saturday and then Sunday and then come home. But people would, would drive from all over Australia to go to the Let's Dance Festival and it was because David Bowie filmed Let's Dance in that little pub. Mm. You know, it's a pretty, it's a one, you know, it's a one-horse town. Uh, that pub was very small and um, it hadn't really been uh, repaired or altered since, I don't know, 100 years ago. Yeah. 
an old tin shed, really. Yeah, but uh, that corner that David Bowie did the film clip in is still it's still there, right? It's got the tiles and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's where we, we set up in in front of that wall where David Bowie did the Let's Dance thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Was that um, during the period of time that he was living in Sydney? Yeah, David Bowie is living next door to me in Sydney. Oh wow! What at your current yeah. address? In Elizabeth Bay. No, I moved. I'm okay. now on the harbour. It was just behind me where okay. I used to live in Elizabeth Bay Road. That's yep. David Bowie lived in um in this beautiful uh, apartment block uh, called Kincoppel. His places they're all named after Aboriginal yep. things. And and how did you know that he was living next door to you? Well. Uh, when I, uh, it was when I first came back from London, you know, late 80s, early 90s. Um, he was here recording uh, an album with his band Tin Machine. You heard of Tin Machine? Mm. It was his sort of uh, pseudo-punk outfit. And they were recording here and they were all living in his beautiful apartment just around the corner. Um, and um, I was just walking down the street uh, one day and he said, hey, you're that, you're that guy that sings in the club just around the corner. I said, yeah. And I said, David Bowie wants to meet you. So they must have been coming into the club where I was singing. It was a club called Round Midnight in King's Cross. And I used to do it every night when I first arrived, just until I found my feet, arrived back in Australia. They dragged me into this cafe, which I still go to now. And uh, I had coffee with David Bowie there. And uh, and he said, where, where do you live? And I said, i oh, just there. And he said, oh, I live next door to you. So I'd never seen him, so he's probably keeping it low. Well, he was probably using um, EMI Studios uh, at you know all the hours when I was wasn't wasn't around through the day and night, but um, yeah, so that was. I mean, that's not the reason why I do the David Bowie shows. It's just that, um, and I had no intention of doing David Bowie shows. It's just that when I came back from London, um, I ended up doing one David Bowie song on a. It was like a David Bowie spectacular with local artists, mm. um, and. Uh, then I did, and then some people said, oh, would you come back and do a whole David Bowie show? And I said, oh, I don't really want to. I'm just doing a new album of my own material. I was with the Jeff Duff Orchestra, that's right. And then uh, and then all of a sudden they said, oh, well, you know, we'll give you a few gigs. And then all of a sudden it's just grown from that. Now I have three Bowie shows. Oh, okay. I do the, the one that I do at Bird's Basement with um, the Bowie Unzip thing, mm. which is a smaller one because we can travel. And then I've got uh, the bigger one, which is Ziggy. And then I've got the uh, the other one I do with the guys from Las Vegas. I do a thing called British Invasion. There was a, a Rod Stewart oh, yes. guy. In yep. Yeah, that's Elton terrific. Guy. That that show is terrific. I've only seen snippets of it on uh, promo, but uh, that Rod Stewart guy and the Elton John guy look pretty uh, authentic. They're amazing. I said to the guy who booked me, I said, look, I'm not going to try and look like David Bowie. I'm not going to sound like David Bowie. I'm not going to act like David Bowie. Mm. You know, I'm I'm just going to be Jeff Duff. Yeah. I said, if you want me to do that, I'll come and do it. But I'm just going to sing. David Bowie, like Jeff Duff, I'm not going to try and impersonate. Those are the Rod Stewart guys, an impersonator. You know, he does Vegas all the time, and also the Elton John guy. They do the, those sort of things. I said I couldn't impersonate anybody, so um, they have to put up with me being me. Mm. And you know, I, uh, and actually, the promoter that uh, once we did the Blood, Sweat, and Tears thing is the same promoter. So um, you know, he these guys they the promoters they always want they almost want me they insist on me not doing my own material because they, they say nobody will come and see you doing your own material mm. you have to do covers you know you have to do tributes and i hate it i really do i i think fucking hell how did i ever get into this situation where i have to do fucking blood sweat and tears and david bowie i've got more albums than both of those acts put together it's, it really is frustrating but I know you. That's got, the way. I, it, it's just it's just how it goes, isn't it? I mean, um, I don't understand it because um, you have had hits, haven't you? Like in your own yeah. right, you've, you've had your own material uh, on radio and charted and all that sort of thing. Yeah, probably more in London than mm. here. But I, yeah, I've had with Cush, you know, the yeah. horn band I was with. We had hits here. We even had a hit with MacArthur's Park, believe it or not. That but, was in the yeah. Was that actually the, the blood, the blood, sweat, and tears band that I'm with are going to be playing some of my original songs. Uh, which are horn-driven things, you know, uh, uh, eight-piece, nine-piece horn things. Great. And Kush, was that in the early seventies? That was that. Yeah, was early seventies through to mid seventies. So and um, so then we did a couple of albums. So did you tour with Kush overseas? Is that your beginning of going to England or? No, no. We 
we never got out of Australia. I mean, we toured Australia, we toured around Australia constantly. You know, we were very popular in Perth and Adelaide and Brisbane and Sydney. And we were a Melbourne band. I was living in Melbourne at the time. And um, uh, we did two albums. The sec the first album was called Snow White and the Eight Straits, which um, Molly Meldrum gave us that title because uh, when he came to see us, the first time he came to see us, I was wearing a wedding dress, you know, because I used to wear drag on stage. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and the band were all in je jeans and T-shirts. So Molly said, well, it looks like Snow White and the Eight Straits. <laughs> was, and that and, was that in the early part of Countdown or...? Yeah, yeah, I was one of the first acts. I was I, I did count then when it was changing from black and white to color. Wow! And unfortunately, um, all of my oh, there's a few snippets of my countdown things, but most of them were taped over because I was using uh, videotape at the time in the early seventies. Mm. So all of my countdowns were taped over because I was trying to save money at the ABC. So I missed. I mean, I, I I've got still photographs of some of the. I mean, I because I used to make my own costumes back then, which were leotards, you know, and crazy, pretty crazy costumes. And I was wearing makeup and you know stuff probably before anybody in Australia. So it was very very theatrical, Jeff Duff, and fairly straight Kush. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were really successful, and you know, we had a few hits, living on Easy Street, and you know. Um, uh, but we were mainly considered a live a live act, a great live act, mm. which is you know what Melbourne. I reckon Melbourne Melbourne is great for that. You know they they seem to have great you know like your brother's band, uh, and and really they have a lifespan of forever, 40, 50 years if they want to keep going. Mm. Like Joe must have been doing it for that long, I guess. He has, yeah. He and you know the audiences in Melbourne, I think, are very loyal with their local acts. They're like football teams, yeah. you know. They they follow you what, what they used to, you know. Like if you were if you were a St Kilda band, as you know, if you were residing in Alwood or St Kilda, you really had a parochial sort of crowd that would follow you everywhere. But if you came from yeah. Coburg or Brunswick, you'd have another type of crowd following you. And because of the, there was pubs on every corner of uh, Melbourne, su the suburban Melbourne streets. Um. You know, you you had large crowds waiting to get in to watch live music. That's probably that seems like a million years ago now, doesn't it? When you when you think about it, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's look. We should we should disregard the fact that we're going through this coronavirus thing at the moment because that's that's going to pass. Mm. I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and and you know, but but I don't think it'll ever go back to that time when no. you know, like Kush and 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 the Falcons were, were doing. Five gigs in a week, and sometimes we like when we had hit records. I don't know, Chris would be doing three gigs in a night. Yeah, you know, people would come along just to hear me sing "Living on Easy Street." Yeah, uh, but yeah, I don't think I think those days are gone, yeah. aren't they? But what what was it like doing three shows in one night? It was look, we had road crew. The road crews back in the in the early seventies were the stars of the show because they had to do all the hard work. Mm. I mean. I don't think there was an instance where you had back line at the different venues you'd go to. I think they had to pack it up. Uh, you'd do a 40-minute set, pack up, go from Box Hill Town Hall to um, Elwood or, or St Kilda or in the Palais or something, and then you'd go off to Ringwood to play at the ice rink. So you'd, <laughs> the poor roadies, you know. Jesus Christ. So, I know. It was hard work. Oh, and, and that stuff was heavy as well back then, you know. Yeah, we, they used to have big Jans boxes, you know, with mm. – 50 inch speakers, you know, which weighed three ton. I don't know how they did it. And all in the back of a combi van, usually. Yeah. And a combi van, is that what they were getting around in back then? Um, yeah, or the equivalent. I, I don't know much about cars, yeah. but, but it was hard work. The roadies were the stars because they really held the, the whole thing together. Sure. And, and you know, they, they became really good at what they did. And a lot of them are world renowned, a lot of the Australian road crews. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Paul Dainty uses. Australian guys all over the place. And I think they've got a really, really good reputation, the Australian road crews. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it, how there's some industries that Australia, it's like the army, right? The Australian army's got a good reputation to fighting, like in Vietnam, they were renowned as good fighters in Vietnam, you know, jungle fighters. Um, it's, it's interesting, isn't yep. it, there's certain elements within Australian culture that uh, for whatever reason we've uh, gravitated to in terms of uh, technical experience or ambushing uh, the Viet Cong in um, northern <laughs> northern 
Vietnam, you know. Well, and <laughs> also in music, I mean, there's been, uh, like, it's few and far between, but, you know, when I was uh, living in London, um, you know, there was um, Men at Work and then Little River Band, well, Little River Band before them, and then, um, you know, every five or ten years an Australian band would break through internationally. Mm. But you know, you know, in excess. But it was always short-lived. They wouldn't, they wouldn't hang around for too long for whatever reason, you know. Mm. Uh, but I think at, at the moment, um, in Hollywood, Australian actors and film, not 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 so much films, but Australian actors and actresses, they seem to be cutting through, don't they? They mm. they do really well. Yeah, they've got a good reputation. Yeah, well, Mel Gibson's done exceptionally well. In Australia, uh, in yeah. America, you know, worldwide. Blanchard and Blanchard. And there's a, there's quite a few them. now. Heaps of them. But, um, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why I was asked to go to um, Las Vegas. I ended up going to Las Vegas to do my Bowie thing uh, last, was it last year? No, the year before last. I, I mean, they, the Americans probably think, oh, it's novel. Hey, we got, you know, an Australian doing David Bowie in Las Vegas. Mm. How weird is that? Did you end up doing that show in Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. We're talking about doing it again. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. And, you know, have you been to Vegas? No, I've never before? been to America. Right. <laughs> now, you have to remember, I went there um, and I was singing with a Rod Stewart guy and an Elton John, the guys that I was working yeah. with in Australia. In Vegas, it's such an incredible, strange industry because uh, a promoter or a manager will find people and uh, they, they may look a little bit like, an original style. They'll look like Prince or they look like David Bowie or Michael Jackson or Sure or something, but they might need a new nose or a new ear or a new chin. So they'll send them off to a plastic surgeon and, you know, get their look refined. Yeah. And then they're, you know, they'll go and do these um, per- impersonation shows. They earn big money in Vegas doing these things. And they, look, it's a bit the same in Australia. Aust- uh, Australian tribute cover bands, they love it here in Australia. And, and they love the impersonators in America, in, in Vegas, you know. They love the original artists, you know, like Elton John when he goes to Vegas, you know, he could sell out for three years and um, and the same with Sher probably. And But but the impersonators are second best, so, you know, if you can't afford to see Sher, you can see a Sher clone. How long were you there for at Las, in Las Vegas? Oh, uh, just a few weeks, you know. It was it was mainly a, a look-see if I if – I, I could grasp what was going on, and I could. I loved it. I loved the whole experience. And yeah, we, when I wasn't working singing, I would the promoter and I would go out every night and catch all these other acts. Not all of them are impersonators, but that seems to be the industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, working in these huge palaces, which are built specifically for these acts, mm. big production acts. You know, yeah. huge production acts. Were you doing like matinees and evening shows, or? Uh, no, they're all evening shows, okay. the shows that I did. But, yeah, they do. They, they'll they have three shows in a night mm. at some of these La- La- Las Vegas palaces. Yeah. And because yeah, you have to remember that people are coming, well, prior to this coronavirus, people were flying in from all over the, the world, all over the world, literally, just to see a show, yeah. staying maybe a, a few days, having a bit of a holiday, and then flying out again. Yeah. And this is going on, you know, 12 months of the year. It's it's huge business. Yeah, I mean, I I, I remember um, last year at Birds. Uh, it was after one of the uh, local acts, and there was this African American lady with her children, and uh, they were really well dressed. And they were with this other African American guy who was really well dressed. They were incredibly dressed, and they they stayed around while I was packing down the show. And uh, it was only myself and the manager and this three people plus the two kids and they were just drawing on their pads and stuff and I, I said how are you going and she goes oh we're fine you know and that she was she had a real southern uh texan uh accent and i said hey you know what, what brings you here and she says oh we just came down we flew in this morning and we're flying out later on tonight back to texas so they flew in just for like eight hours and then they're catching it and i said what you just came to have dinner at Birds and um, watch the show and then go again. She says, yeah, we just came down. Oh, so they didn't perform, they only came they, to see they, a show. Yeah, they came to see a show and then they were catching a taxi back to the airport to go back to – and I've never, ever heard anything like it in my life. It was just 
I, I thought, well, at least stay a couple of days and see what's around, you know, that's or well, something like that. Why go through all of that for one day? You know, it's sort of weird. But, you know, there are loyal, passionate fans for people that, you know, maybe we, we don't even rate, you yeah. know, that, or they might be in some way connected yeah. uh, emotionally, physically. So, I mean, that, that's good. Yeah, but in Vegas, that's, I reckon that's, that's most, of the, audience, most yeah. of the audience are travellers. Yeah. They're not from Vegas, you know. Yeah, well, they've got other thing reasons to be there. I guess they're they're gambling. Oh, let's go and see a show. Have have some dinner. Have see a show. Let's go gamble again. You know, I mean, there's multiple uh, streams of entertainment, isn't there, in Vegas? Yeah, and the restaurants are yeah. pretty high high class yeah. too in in Vegas. I mean, it is. It's a fascinating. You know, I think everybody should go to Vegas. You know, just to experience how the other half live. Mm. It's, it's strange, and it's um, it's pretty disgusting as well. But you know. After you get over all, all that, uh, you know, it can be enjoyable. Yeah. It's a real eye-opener. But you, you really do need a lot of money. I was, you know, all of my, I was, you know, because I was performing there, I was, everything was on the house. But um, if you're going in just as a, a traveller, I think you, you do need a lot of money. You've been a vegan for a long time. What prompted you to become a vegan? Um, when I first moved to London in the late 70s, 78, Oh, no, I was I was vegetarian in in Australia before then, and you know as you can see, I'm, I've always been very thin anyway. But uh, my mum died when I first arrived in uh, London in '78 from that from the respiratory problem. You know, she, she had um, an infection on her lungs. For, for a short burst, I started drinking, and I don't even I've never really drunk. I don't really, and I don't I haven't drunk since. Uh, and uh, I thought, gee, I'm going to change my life around, so I became vegan. But then. I became so paranoid about my weight. I became anorexic. I, I got really, really, really thin. Yeah, I was vegan for the 10 years that I lived in London. Uh, and uh, look, it's very, very hard to get over anorexia. You know, not many males, or maybe there are more males today because it seems to be uh, people are more concerned about their, their physical being lately, aren't they? You know, so maybe there are more anorexic males, but... I beat it eventually, and you know I love eating now. Mm. <laughs> I love, I love nothing else. because I play so much sport. I'm so physical; I, I could never put on any weight. But, um, oh, you're amazing because you f- still fit in clothes that were made you, made for you in the seventies, right? Yeah, that that red suit that yeah. I wore at um, Bird's Basement yeah. was made for me when I was doing Countdown. Uh, Michael Gadinsky was so I was signed to Mushroom Records. He was so annoyed with me wearing leotards on Countdown all the time. He said, I'm sending you off to a tailor and you're going to get a three-piece suit made. And, yeah, I, wear, I still wear that suit today. It, it was so beautifully made, you know, they don't make suits like that. That was 1976. Yeah, I still fit into that. So, I mean, you know, I can't change my body shape. I've always been a stick stick man. So in, so in 1978, what was it like leaving Australia to go to um, the UK? Well, look, I was getting into so much trouble in in, in 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 Melbourne. I mean, I was living in Melbourne. I was getting banned all the time for being, you know, a little bit of a rascal, you know. Back then, even swearing and carrying on like a sort of, it was a tail end of punk, I suppose, in, in London. Uh, but I, I'd sort of caught the punk disease and I thought, fucking hell, I want to go and see the Pistols and Clash and all these notorious punk bands. So... That's what attracted me to London. And my mum said, look, Jeffrey, you're getting into so much trouble here in Melbourne. Go, get out of here. So I went over there and I got stuck into it. And I, I loved it. It was so exciting. Once again, here comes the spit thing again. I was getting gobbed off stage. But I loved it. I lo- it was so exciting. And, you know, my first uh, record in London went straight into the British charts first weekend. And I was doing all these concerts all over the the UK and all over Europe, actually, on the strength of my first album and first record. And um, but you know, I'd stopped eating. Mm. I don't know how I survived when I look back at it. it was just, huh? That would be a hard thing to go through. Yeah, and ironically, the guy that toured with me through Europe is the guy that I'm. It's producing my new album oh, there you online go. now. Wow, he's still with it. Well, I'm forty years later. Mm. Oh, that's great. He, he's, also, he's also the keyboard player in a band called Mungo Jerry, remember? In the summertime. Oh, yeah. Actually, an Australian band recorded those two songs, Push Bike Song and uh, In the Summertime. Yeah, right. An Australian band called The Mixtures. Okay. Yeah, actually, Sev, my producer in London, said he said they just 
Ray Dorset was celebrating I, I, either the Mungo Jerry guy celebrating either the 40th or the 50th anniversary of Pushbike Song wow. in London. Wow. You know, they did one of those videos where there was somebody in Istanbul, somebody in oh, Sydney, yeah. somebody in Mexico, they were all singing the Pushbike oh, Song terrific. and doing a, a mass Oh, that's terrific. Video. That's awesome. And that's, yeah. and that's a great song. You know, it's a great song to analyse as a uh, tribute song 50 years later because it's a pushbike song and a lot of people are riding those pushbikes these days. Perfect timing. And yeah. also when it happened, this was last Friday, I think it was last Friday, yeah, um, it was International Bicycle Day. Oh. Well, that's appropriate, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, but, I, you know, it's the same as any international whatever day. I think somebody's making money out of it, oh, yeah, all totally. the pushbike companies. Yeah, totally. So what, I don't know if you can see in my behind me. I've got two incredible bicycles made by uh, Lekka, which is a Dutch company. I've got an electric bike and a manual bike, and they're both beautiful-looking specimens. <laughs> I love my bike. Ah, oh, David Bowie. <laughs> that was sent to me by Bowie's um, management company and uh, or his production company in London. Okay, it was moulded off his uh, off his of Bowie's actual face. Yeah. They took a mould of his face. It's inc- beautiful, isn't yeah, it's it? It's incredible. When did they do the mould off Bowie's face? Well, they would have done it in 1973, which is uh, it's off the Aladdin Sane album. You know the where the, yeah. the lightning bolt comes. Okay. So yeah, it would have been 73. Wow. He was very thin too. Mm. I think Bowie suffered from the same thing I did. Okay. Well, no, he, he never said he was anorexic, but he didn't really eat much. He used to live on um, cigarettes, uh, cocaine, black coffee, and milk. Yeah. And he was a big cigarette smoker. I think that killed him yeah. in the end because, look, he's only 69. Yeah. Um, and uh, he just couldn't stop. Yeah. You know, they, I'm sure you know people that just doesn't matter what they do, they don't know how to stop smoking. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's a disgusting habit and uh, it's a very bad, um, it's very bad for you, you know. Like I'm glad that uh, I was able to see the light when I uh, gave up the cigarettes, you know. I'd rather talk about your um, your casting in your sci-fi film uh, as and your time as an actor. When did you do that sci-fi film? Uh, when I first came back from London, actually, in 1989 or something like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I just arrived back in Australia and um, I ha- I did have I had a video for Walk on the Wild Side with that makeup thing. Did you ever see that where my face was being made up? Actually, it was David Bowie's makeup artist, Richard Shara, who made my face up and then ripped it all off. And the director of this movie saw saw this video and he said, wow, he'd be great in our sci-fi movie. So I went along to audition. They thought I was, you know, like a suitable case for treatment. So I ended up playing the lead in the, in the, in the sci-fi movie Sons of Steel. Actually, they, there was a, what was it called? It was called The Dangerous Film Festival, I think, here in Sydney. Uh, last, I oh, know no, it's before before the coronavirus, so late last year, and uh, Sons of Steel was there, and I had to I had to go along with the other cast members and meet meet the public. <laughs> I'm not a film star, but I mean it was uh, it was fun seeing the movie again on the big screen. Were you, did you have a major part in that film, or were you? Yeah, yeah. I was one of the leads. Okay. Yeah, and then and then I ended up doing um, The Great Gatsby with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh right, and that was you know I was just a. Uh, a featured extra, I suppose you'd say. I had, but my my part was incredible because because of my my um, uh, my, my experience with costumes, I I, I ended up uh, having a half a dozen different costumes in in The Great Gatsby. I even ended up with these huge wings, uh, looking like an angel playing a ukulele. And, um, yeah, I had great costumes. Everybody else had, because uh, these were the party scenes, everybody else in that, in that movie had um, dinner suits. You know, they all looked like penguins, but I looked like a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, a, that, was, that was many years later you would have been in The Great Gatsby. Cause, yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that was sort of recent history. Yeah. That was, I think, 2007 yeah, or 8 yeah. or 9 or something like that. Yeah. Actually, last night um, somebody texted me and said, oh, you're on television tonight. You're, I was on Spix and Specs last night and they were talking about me being banned on the Ray Martin show for um, for uh, a costume malfunction. You were banned <laughs> on the Ray Ma- Martin show? Yeah, because I was 
I used to do the midday show all the time when I first came back from London. And I was, um, they, they'd call me, the producer, and say, Would you, could you come on and sing this song? Come and sing, you know, What's Going On, Marvin Gaye, or come and sing this or that. And I'd say, sure, sure. And they asked me to go on and sing Fever, the Peggy Lee song. Never knew how much I missed you. That song. And uh, I said, yeah. So I went along. I had my band, a, a great band, and um, I thought I'd surprise them because I'd be doing a show dressed pretty normally. I thought I'd go on and I'd um, I'd wear a leotard, thigh-length boots, lots of makeup, bouffant my hair out, false eyelashes, and I went on. And um, I didn't tell anybody what I was wearing. We, we did a camera check with the, with the Channel 9 crew, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, Ray Martin said, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Duff, fever. And I walked out and I was in this leotard, you know, with thigh-length boots. But I had been in the dressing room with my girlfriend at the time, Tawny, and um, I'd got excited. She'd got me excited, so I had a little bit of an erection. So uh, I couldn't get rid of it. And <laughs> Ray Martin had introduced me on stage. And I walked out and I thought, what am I going to do with my my penis um so i had to go on so all of a sudden the, 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 they'd done a camera check with me looking normal all of a sudden the cameras had to had to shoot from above the waist because i was sort of half falling out of the leotard so so, <laughs> so i got banned so they were doing the uh, elvis thing where elvis where they wouldn't show elvis's feet they were doing that yeah yeah but his was from for, for dancing wasn't yeah, it dancing, wasn't it suggestive yeah. dancing yeah, suggestive and stuff dancing, yeah, yeah. Moments for exposure and malfunction. So, yeah. so how did they approach you with that? After the show, they just said, "Jeff, uh, we can't be having that. You can't come back again." You know what? I knew as soon as I'd walked off stage because um, apparently one of the one of the producers said, "Oh, the the, uh, the phone lines have gone off the hook. People calling, oh, wow. complaining that they couldn't see enough." Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. And that was in the, what, in the early 90s that that would have happened, yeah? Yeah, 91. Yeah, yeah wow. It was in 91. I didn't realise until last night when I said that on the – Because you would have thought by 91 that would have been fairly acceptable for, you know, midday viewers, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, they, had, they used to have drag acts on, but I guess um, it was – see, they like to do camera checks and they like to know exactly what's going on. Mm. And uh, I caught them by surprise because all of a sudden, you know, I was probably dressed like this, similar to this, in the camera check. And then all of a sudden I come out looking like um, Danny LaRue or one of those drag artists, mm. RuPaul, uh, and they weren't prepared for it, you know. And uh, I've got very long legs, you know. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, it would have looked pretty funny. It would have caught, caught them off guard. But, you know, I was, you know, I, I mean, I've gotten into, you know, a lot of silly little trouble things along through my career, career, but they've never really hurt anybody. They've just probably dented my reputation or added to my reputation of being a scallywag, that's all. You know, my father used to keep saying, uh, in Kush times in Melbourne, he used to keep saying, Jeffrey, you've got such a beautiful voice. Why do you have to dress like that? And I had no answer. I just said, I don't know. It's just what I do, yeah. you know. That's what I do. Well, I think it's terrific. I mean, you know, the times that I've worked with you, I think you've looked incredible, you know. You sounded incredible. You've looked incredible. It's been a real pleasure actually working with you. Um, and uh, the last time we worked together was, uh, what, it was January, Good. was it th January this year? Maybe, yeah, just before, before the, the yeah, virus thing it was, in. yeah. Yeah, it was. And that was a great, because I remember it was it was really hot. It was really, really hot, and I had to open up the back door to get some fresh air, mate, because I was uh, I was sweating at the desk, and I remember it was boiling hot that day. It was great. It had, it had a real pub, and it was packed. It was wasn't packed. It? Yeah, it was packed, and it had a real pub vibe about it, you know, because of the heat. You know, it was terrific. Yeah, and and they were all real Bowie fans, the people there. And we, actually, we did a couple of nights, didn't we? In yeah, row, I think. three. I think it was three nights. <laughs> three nights. Yeah. From... yeah. Well, I can't wait to do that again. Yeah. And actually, the, like if we don't do the Bowie thing, I'm sure um, um, El Bear will love the blood, sweat and tears thing. Oh, yeah. Hot, hot positions. But I, I was going to ask <laughs> you, you, you've performed Bowie, Walker, Sinatra. Uh, which, which ones out of the three do, have you enjoyed the most? Hello. <laughs> um, uh, I, love, <laughs> I love Scott Walker. Yeah, that was terrific. You know they're doing one in Melbourne, a Scott Walker tribute? Who is? Um, Dave Bowers. Okay. Do you know Dave Bowers? No. Eugene Hamilton. 
Uh, no. Steve Hadley? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, they're all. Are they from bands? Well, Steve used to play with the Black Sorrows years ago um, and he was approached by a promoter in Melbourne to do a Scott Walker tribute and then they've got uh, Dave Graney, I think, is and Claire Moore playing in it and uh, it, it's a it's a big ensemble. Like they've got backing singers, keyboard players. Strings? No strings. Um, oh, can't be the real yeah, thing then. Yeah, but the, the keyboard players are doing all the string parts, I think. But um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I haven't I haven't seen it, but I was I, I did a podcast with him and I know that they had done a couple of shows at the Thornbury Theatre and uh, and I said, Oh well I did one with Jeff Duff and it was terrific, you know. And he didn't know that you'd done it. So it's interesting, isn't it, how you don't know that they've done it and they didn't and they didn't know that you've done it. So and I said, No, he did Yeah, it. but I'm I, I reckon I reckon and this is just me speaking off the cover, I reckon I'm a, the biggest Scott Walker fan in the world, you oh, know, yeah. because uh, I was recording um, Walker Brothers songs when I was 14, you know. So I've followed him. I have every album. As you know, you know, yeah. you're a Scott Walker fan too. I think if you're, if you're into Scott Walker, you're into, yeah. you're into him thick and... You know. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Like he, he is un, undoubtedly uh, an underrated artist for, for his time. I, re, I really believe that, you know. But not, no, I mean, you know, maybe with that that um, that big lineup of artists mm. you're talking in Melbourne, they'll get you know lots of fans. But I mean, as you know, when I did it at Bird's Basement, there was no one there, and uh, uh, Albert kept saying to me, you know, Albert who runs uh, Bird's Basement kept saying, look, nobody's heard of Scott Walker, yeah. so you're not going to get an audience. And I said, I don't care, I still yeah. want to do it. I know, and but I thought it was a terrific. I mean, the people who saw it thought thought it was amazing. And I remember, I remember when we did. If you go away, you know, mm. Nomakita Pa, yeah. that um, beautiful Scott Walker thing. Um, the girls in the front tables, they were bawling their eyes yeah. out. It was so romantic. Yeah. And because uh, uh, Glenn said to me, look at those girls down the front there in tears. Yeah. Um, and it, it is that sort of music, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah, yeah. So oh, it's moving. And uh, I remember one guy came up to me. He said, oh, you know, this is an amazing show. He, he, re he really loved the show. He said, look, I've seen people trying to do Scott Walker, but this is the best one I've seen. You know, it's incredible. You know, he was really talking yeah, it up. Good. Yeah, those people doing the Melbourne, are, are, are they good singers? They're, 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 the they're, I've only seen snippets on uh, Facebook uh, of their show in Thor at the Thornbury Theatre, but it's a different thing. It's... Um, it's not like what we did at Birds. It's, it's more um, contemporary. You know, they're using the songs, but they're making it more contemporary. If you know what I mean, like. But it's got the melody, right. and it's got yeah. So yeah, you can tell it's a Scott Walker song, but it's more um, you know, contemporary. contemporary. They can the the public can eat it a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah. Because I know when we did my Scott Walker thing, and I did a few. I, I did a couple of yeah, nights you there, did didn't I? four nights or whatever it was, something like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, I loved I was in heaven doing yeah. Scott Walker. And look, I have to tell you, look, I've finished this album here now that I'm doing. The producer, my English friend in London, he said to me, Duffo, you have to do one Scott Walker song on your album. So I've recorded If You Go Away. Yeah. But in a, in a different, it's with a groove. It's sort of a, a funk groove. Yeah. Well, there you, know? you go. And it sounds, sounds incredible. So... Yeah, I mean, I love my original songs, but I, I love just the idea of doing one Scott Walker song. Oh, yeah. Montague in Blue is the one that I like. Yeah, 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 yeah that's beautiful. Well, we did just about every Scott Walker song yeah, when I played did. at Bird, but it's pretty sad uh, as were written about that um, Italian poet mm. and uh, who uh, who was murdered in the farmyard. Yeah. Do I hear 21? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So you, you've made a book about yourself. Um, what made you decide to write a book about yourself? Uh, was there a moment that led you to make this decision or? No, I didn't. I, you know, I mean, I write, I write songs and I've written lots of short stories, but um, this uh, publisher in Melbourne, once again, the Melbourne, Melbourne Connection um, from Melbourne Books uh, contacted me and he said, would you consider writing um an autobiography about your life, and he ha he already had it planned. What the uh, the front cover was going to be that costume that I made that I was arrested in 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 Melbourne and Ballarat in 1976. I I wore this costume and um, I was dragged off stage by the police because they thought it was a little bit too risque. 
the owner of Melbourne Books is fan. He's he just ended up being a real fan, and also he's a real cricket fan, so he's really on my side. Mm. He would have been a fan in the seventies, right? Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's you know roughly the same age. I guess he was a fan. Oh, and also he's got a, he's got an incredibly talented son who plays uh, jazz piano. He tours all around the world playing jazz piano. He's amazing. Okay. So uh, he's very musically inclined, the uh, the publisher. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, he said start writing your biography, and I did. And you know, most of it is is very rock and roll, pretty rough. You know, I write about the orgies that I was involved in, about sleeping with celebrities, and um, you know, getting you know all the trouble I've gotten into. And he said, he said, yeah, we want more of that. And I said, well, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you what happened. Whenever I'd write something about my sexual encounters, he'd say, can you can you make it a little bit more grubby? <laughs> well, that was all pre-AIDS, wasn't it? So you had the you had the uh, time of your life, basically, because um, when I turned 18 was 1988. So, um, you know, AIDS was well in, in the system by 1988. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we copped the bad end of the stick, I reckon, my generation, you know. Yeah, that's true. I was lucky. I mean, I had a free reign in the 70s. Uh, early 70s, mid 70s, and also because I was, you know, I was on television just about every day. I was doing so much television in Melbourne. I do morning shows, cooking shows, evening shows, variety shows. You know, I I remember doing Don Lane's show, Ernie Sigley's show, um, Bert Newton's show, uh, all these, Graham Kennedy. I did them all. I did so many shows. Uh, so I was uh, fairly well known in Melbourne circles. Um, so uh, I would have been a bit of a conquest for uh, females. Mm. I have to tell your audience, unfortunately, you've got it wrong. I'm not gay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had, I had You're up for a grabs. Lot of female lovers mm. back in the 70s when, when I was a rock star there. Yeah. So, touring in Cush in the early 70s and going to places like Ballarat and country Victoria or country New South Wales, uh, what was that like? Like, what. It was were there plenty of teenage kids waiting at the front of the uh, stage door and all that sort of stuff? Or yeah, we had we had all of that. But look, because of the way I was dressing, you know, like as I said, I think I was probably the first uh, artist and rock artist in Australia to wear full makeup and you know occasionally drag and wearing. You know, I was doing the Bowie thing before I'd even heard of David Bowie. So um, I'd get uh, a lot of gay guys coming along to my gigs just assuming that I was gay because of the way I dressed. And actually in Melbourne, I used to do, uh, you weren't around, but in the uh, early, mid-70s in Melbourne, they used to have gay dances. There was one called Jan's Dance, which was uh, run for um, lesbians and, well, for gay guys as well. You know, it was just a, a gay dance, but it was, that was fantastic. It was in South Yarra. And then there was uh, another one called Spangles, which was also a, a notorious gay dance every weekend. And I used to perform at those things. Too. Was that insane? If I didn't perform, I'd go along there because that was sort of safe. Even though I wasn't gay, I mean, I used to get beaten up a lot in Melbourne, <laughs> uh, you know, under the suspicion of being gay. You know, it was like that, you yeah. know, with the Sharpies. and mm. Rough time. Yeah, but it was great. You know, all of the all of the rough times that I've – look, in, when I arrived in London, I, got, I was beaten up a lot too. The National Front, who were um, – the people that worshipped Hitler. Oh, Jesus. Um, yeah, they they were notorious. They used to have shaved heads and those metal bother boots they'd wear and they'd kick the hell out of you. I remember the first gig, I, the record company took me along to my first gig. It was to see, you know, because I thought I was a punk. Of course, I wasn't a punk because I was too nice to be a punk. But anyway, I wanted to be a punk. So I, one of the first gigs I went to um, was to see a band called The Lurkers who were a, a notorious punk band in London. And uh, they were playing just near where I lived in uh, Ladbroke Grove in uh, in London, just off Portobello Road. And um, it was, they were nearly all National Front people at this at this concert. And then um, the Lurkers were playing. And then I looked up on stage, and they the National Front guys they stormed the stage. They went running towards the stage. They picked up a microphone stand and hit the singer with a microphone stand. They all stormed the stage. His head split open, blood spurred all over the place. I thought, fucking hell, I have to get out of here. I felt like I was the only non-National Front person, but I was with the record company boss. So we 
and all all the all the exits were blocked by the National Front, so you couldn't get out. So I thought, well, we're going. I said to Nick Nick Austin, who was the head of uh, Beggars Banquet Records, and I said, we're going to we're going to get beaten up, but let's just run. <laughs> I ran I ran down Portobello Road and I hid in a um, a telephone box, one of those you know Doctor Who telephone boxes. And my hand went up. I was living with the he- with the people from uh, the heads of Virgin International, Virgin Records, Laurie Dunn. And my hand went up and I dialed the phone so that nobody could see me in, <laughs> in the road. And I said, come and pick me up, man. I'm going to be killed. So they came and picked me up in my phone box. Unfortunately, the head of the Beggar's Banquet Record Company, he didn't make it out. Oh, he got He got really, really Climate. badly beaten up. Yeah. And I... Uh, later on that night, I went and visited <laughs> visited him in hospital. Oh. I felt guilty because I got away. He should have followed you. Well, we ran in different directions because that, because that was a, the smartest thing to do. And I've I've always been pretty fast, mm. so um, uh, you, you, he wasn't you, very. You, fast. you tend to run faster if you know your life is in danger. I reckon. Yeah, and these guys they, these guys were killing people. These mm. the National Front. I mean, they were they were notorious. They were. They were nasty people, mm. and they wore these things called bover boots, which have got a metal toe. Yeah, great. So they just kicked the hell out of you, and that could do some damage. Obviously, I, th- I think of the early nineties as a very progressive period of time, but now looking back on it, it was quite conservative. Australia is yeah, conservative. It man. is. Yeah, I've gotten into so much trouble. Like last night on Spicks and Specs, I couldn't believe it because I'd never seen it before. You know, somebody texted me and they said, oh, you're on Spicks and Specs. I watched it. Uh, Adam Hills, you know, is the host. He said to me, ladies and gentlemen, we've got, this is the most controversial artist we've ever, ever had on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Duff. And I thought, me, controversial. I was, it was like Mickey Mouse to me. Mm. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, he's overstating it, I think, a bit, isn't he? Oh, well, I think so. Yeah. I think, you know, if you ask my mum and dad, well, my dad thought I was a little bit strange just because of the clothes I was yeah. wearing, but controversial. No, nah, you weren't no. controversial. No, nah, far from it, I think, Jeff. Although when I play cricket and tennis, they think I'm a little bit weird, you know, when I wear the little dress, little skirts. <laughs> well, <laughs> do you wear that at tennis? Do you wear the skirts at, when you play tennis? Yeah, okay. I always have crotchless yeah, undies right. underneath too because when I'm <laughs> when I'm serving... Jesus. It puts the opponent off oh, when I'm well, saying that's an advantage. What's your plans next? I mean, outside of your um, record and, uh, you know, your plans to tour, obviously, later in the year, but outside of that, what, what any other plans? I'd, lo- well, I'd love to catch up with Sev Lukowicz, the, uh, the producer in London, and tour, tour London with my new record because when I was Duffo, I used to tour there in the 80s, mm. so it's – 35, 40 years later, I think it'd be great. And, you know, like I, I still have as much energy as I did back then and I'm still driven more than any, but I just think, you know, I, people keep saying, well, how, how have you managed to record 30 albums? I said, because that's what I do. I mean, you know, I don't have, I haven't had a partner since the 1991 or something. So I've been literally celibate. So all my energy goes into, uh, into my music and my performances. Mm. And I, I love it. You know, I think whenever I've had a relationship, it always slows me down and I, and I hate it. And I think, fucking hell, what am I doing with this? Per-? Even though, you know, like it's, it's nice having a partner occasionally, but I, I prefer it on my own. I've lived in solitude here for uh, 30 years yeah. in Elizabeth Bay yeah. and I love it. Yeah. It's fantastic. Well, and, I, I manage, and I become so productive. You know, like... Um, I do all these, but I've got those four Bowie shows that I'm doing. And, you know, I just found out, as I said yesterday, I've just been lined up my Bowie show to do the Opera House. And in the meantime, I've recorded this album and I've formed this Blood, Sweat and Tears Chicago band as well. So, I, you know, I just keep doing things because, not because I have to, but because I, I, I want to, you know. It just seems like a progression of all my energy. It has to come out somehow. Yeah. But, I, but I, look, I'm not poo-pooing having a relationship, but I just find for me it's better if I'm not in a relationship because yeah. when I'm in a relationship, I tend to give it all and that, I, never, I never do anything yeah. when I'm in a relationship, unfortunately. Yeah, so you're more uh, productive being on your own. Yeah, and I love living in solitude. Like nobody, I can't remember the last time somebody visited me here. I mean, I live right on, on the harbour 
my balcony overlooks a harbour and I live in the corner of the, the apartment block. I mean, I said to my neighbour the other night, I said, can you hear me when I'm singing at three in the morning? And they said, no. So so these are bulletproof apartments. So, you know, I I, I, I lose track of time completely. It could be, I mean, I know it's dark here now, but it could be in the afternoon, it could be in the morning, it could be any time. Yeah. You know, when you're creating, I think you forget about time. You do. I ne- you know, I never know. I, you know, it's a bit of a problem because I, I think, fuck, when was the last time I ate? Mm. And I think, c- come on, Jeffrey, you have to eat. Mm. You know, you're playing cricket, tennis, you're running around the block every day. You have to, you need fuel, you need energy. So I make myself eat, mm. otherwise I forget. Totally. Yeah, it's easy to do that. All right. Well, it's been great talking with you, Jeff. I appreciate your time, buddy. Can we start the interview now? <laughs> It's been terrific. You've done a fantastic job. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's, I love talking about me. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, nice Not, catching up with you again, and I look forward to coming down to Melbourne to do Birds. Absolutely, yeah. Jeff. Take care, buddy. You must have cast a spell.